All set. Okay. Welcome everyone to our core facility seminar series. Today we'll be featuring the CT and optical imaging technologies found in our animal imaging facility. For those of you who do not know me, I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. In today's seminar, you will be hearing from Amy Burnside, the Director of Animal Imaging and our Flow Cytometry Corps, as well as our guest speaker, Sarah Guyette, Field Application Scientist at Perkin Elmer. We're hoping that with these bi-weekly seminars, you will discover what great resources that the centralized UMass Amherst core facilities offer to our campus community and the New England region and beyond. Now, just for a few housekeeping items, this seminar is being recorded. If you miss any part of this seminar, or would like to forward it to someone who cannot attend, there will be a replay of this in all previous seminars in this series on our website. I will put the link in the chat. I recommend you set your view mode to speaker. Please stay muted during the talks. We will save the Q&A until the end of the presentations. During that time, I welcome you to use the raised hand feature. Once called upon, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Also, you can put your questions into the chat, which I will be monitoring. Thank you. Next up, I would like to introduce you to Andrew Bernard, the director of our UMass Amherst core facilities. Andrew? Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Lisa mentioned, my name is Andrew Bernard, and I'm the director of centralized core facilities here at UMass Amherst. We know the great impact our core facilities have on the research community, but too often we find out too late that others on and off campus are not familiar with our capabilities. So we're hosting this core seminar series to provide awareness and to hear from our partners, including success stories from experienced users and technology experts. This is our fifth seminar of the semester with several more to come. And we are already busy planning for the spring semester. If there are cores or specific technologies you would like us to feature, please let us know by filling out the form that Lisa will link to in the chat. For those who haven't interacted with us much, the UMass core facilities are open to anyone from undergrads through senior scientists, regardless of your affiliation, including researchers from other academic institutions and commercial partners. From sending samples for analysis, to designs for 3D printing, to becoming a trained user on advanced imaging instrumentation, there are ample opportunities for engagement, no matter your level of expertise. Additionally, there are many opportunities to fund your work in the course. For UMass users, there are several seed fund funding programs, and core credits are available to all IELTS faculty members. For our external users, the Mass Innovation Voucher Program subsidizes usage for small companies based in Massachusetts at up to 75%. Over the last two years, across the five UMass campuses, we have awarded more than 400 vouchers worth more than $5 million. We are here to be your partner and to help expand your research productivity. Please feel free to reach out directly to me or to any of the core facility directors if you have questions or would like more information about our capabilities or how to access the resources. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amy Burnside, Director of both Flow Cytometry and Animal Imaging Core Facilities. Dr. Burnside joined UMass in 2008, taking over management of the Flow Cytometry Core in 2011, five years before the establishment of IELTS and centralized cores at UMass. Her experience as an educator and in-depth knowledge across many disciplines make her an indispensable component to the research enterprise at UMass. We are incredibly grateful for Amy's contributions to core facilities and to the research community at large. With that, I'll pass it over to Amy and we'll be here and available during the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Lisa, for organizing the core facility seminars. Um, as Andrew said, I'm the director of the um, animal imaging facility. Um, in the animal imaging facility, we do in vivo three-dimensional um, x-ray scanning and micro CT imaging. We also have a, ha house an animal ultrasound um, and an IVA spectrum CT. We perform, we train users for the instruments and we help with experiment and research design consultation. Our tools are, as I mentioned, the IVA Spectrum CT, the Sonovet Doppler Color Ultrasound System, um, and the Brooker Skyscan Micro CT, so capable of live animal and <clears throat> specimen scanning. We can help you with this in vivo imaging, engaging with animal care, as well as writing IACO protocols to use our um, several instruments. Um, we will also collaborate with um, projects and consultations, um, as well as help with grant engagements, including letters of recommendation um, for, and you can write our facility into your grant uh, in your budget. Um, how do you know do you, you'd like to use the core facility? Are you performing research with animals and would like to reduce your numbers and increase your impact while monitoring progress of your research in real time? Um, 
we've been used to monitor oncology research where you can look at tumor size and viability, bacterial and infectious, dis other viral infectious diseases research. If you'd like to monitor your drug delivery, be it through nanoparticles or other um, antibody delivery vehicles, um, or you can monitor inflammation and causes, treatments, and effects. Um, stem cell therapy is also um, one way you can apply our technologies. And are you interested in the effects of genes or other systems on metabolic or musculoskeletal developments? So if you'd like to know more about this, we are actually hosting today Sarah Guillet from Perkin Elmer. And here's my information. Sorry, this is the first time I've done a seminar on Zoom. So we are learning, I'm learning as I go. Um, but if you'd like to reach me for any of the, um, to use the core facility, this is my contact information. You can also find me at UMass People Finder. Um, my, la uh, my office is in um, LSL. Um, and today we've invited Sarah Villa from Perkin Elmer. She's a field application scientist. She is a cancer biologist with um, seven years of translational research. Prior to Perkin Elmer, she was a senior staff scientist at TCR Squared Therapeutics, where she did research um, in CAR T uh, therapeutics um, and used the IBIS in her research. So she comes to us with a nice background of science as well as technology. And I'm going to hand this over to Sarah today. Sarah, thank you for joining us. And I'll stop sharing my screen so when you're ready, you can share yours. Nice. Thanks for the introduction. Let me get my screen sharing up here. Let me know when you can see everything normally. It looks great, Sarah. Good. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so thanks again for inviting me to give this talk today. I wanted to spend some time giving you a background on IVIS imaging, as well as some examples from other labs in various applications to hopefully spark some ideas of how you can use IVIS in your work. So I'll start with kind of an overview of how IVIS came to be. We started with very simple 2D bioluminescence imaging, and then added in fluorescence and anatomical x-ray. We've since expanded into 3D technology with optical 3D tomography. So for example, here you're able to visualize a bioluminescent tumor. We also have standalone CT systems. Amy just mentioned you also have a Bruker system, and this allows for higher resolution scanning. So here we're actually looking at a pregnant rat with all of the pups inside. And with the spectrum CT system that you guys have in house, you can combine your optical signal with CT in the same system. And this will allow you to add in nice 3D anatomical registration to your 3D optical reconstructions. So Amy already mentioned some of these, but I just wanna go over again, what are the benefits of IVIS imaging? As she mentioned, you can longitudinally and non-invasively monitor your disease. This allows you to not only decrease the number of animals you need, but give you measurable economic benefits as you are having reduced animal costs as well as less personnel needed to run these studies. You can simultaneously gain insight into drug efficacy, kinetics, your drug targeting, and your mechanism of action by using various reporters in vivo. In addition to visualization of your data with these pretty pictures, you also get great quantification of this data with superior statistics and data reproducibility on the IVIS systems. So what can you actually use the IVIS to image? The vast majority of users perform bioluminescence imaging, uh, specifically using Firefly luciferase as a reporter. Firefly luciferase does require the addition of a substrate, which in the presence of ATP and oxygen, so essentially live cells, will produce light. So one great thing about bioluminescence imaging is that it's very quite, it's really simple. There's very high signal to background ratio. So data analysis is very streamlined and it's really great for things like genetic reporters or localizing proteins, or if you are trying to detect a small cell population in vivo, bioluminescence is the way to go. Looking over toward the right side of this figure, Fluorescent light does require an excitation light source, and then you collect emitted light back onto the CCD camera and the IVIS. Things like fluorescent proteins, just GFP or RFP, kind of bridge the gap between luciferase and fluorescent dyes. When you're setting up experiments, 
we try to steer you away from using things like GFP in a mouse model. GFP is really, really great for a lot of things, flow cytometry, histology, et cetera. But once you put it into a mouse, there are a lot of potential problems you can run into. Uh, so what we like to say if you're going to be using fluorescence is redder is better. So try to select reporters that are more red shifted. And that also applies for fluorescent dyes. So the beauty of fluorescent dyes is really unlimited potential. There are a ton of dyes to choose from, and you can label nearly anything from proteins to antibodies to nanoparticles uh, to cells. So in general, when using either fluorescent proteins or fluorescent dyes, just remember redder is better. As far as looking at specific applications for the IVIS system, applications are really endless. The most common studies you're probably used to seeing are in the area of oncology. For example, here, these authors were assessing therapeutic efficacy in a primary model of cancer or metastatic models. But I wanted to show you today that you can really use the IVIS system for many other applications. And of course, I don't have time here to go through all of these endless possibilities, but I've compiled some examples in other applications for you to consider. So I'm going to go through examples specifically from the field in a few of these. So first, let's look at how to use IVIS to explore different aspects of infection. In this first study, the authors were looking to study the pathogenesis of human smallpox and to develop new therapies by creating new animal models. Using wild type and immunodeficient rats, they engineered a vaccinia virus carrying firefly luciferase, and they used this to recapitulate the infectious and clinical features of human smallpox. They found that in their immunodeficient rat strain that was more susceptible to infection, and it had a slower virus clearance rate, monitoring the disease over time using IVIS imaging. I will also just mention here that, yes, IVIS does stand for in vivo imaging system, but you can remove organs and image those on the IVIS as well to confirm location of your signal, as making those assumptions in, in 2D is sometimes risky. Uh, but as Amy mentioned, you do have the capacity for 3D imaging, so I'm going to talk about that toward the end and how that can really help you improve your data. Aside from monitoring infectious disease development, you can also use the IVIS to characterize mechanisms. <clears throat> in this case, the authors used a titanium wire and surgically placed it into the femur of mice. These mice possess GFP expressing neutrophils. And so they inoculated a bacterial strain into the knee joint before they closed up after adding this titanium wire. So they combined bioluminescence imaging with fluorescence imaging and X-ray, and they further did 3D micro CT to monitor not only the infection, but the neutrophil activity to the infection and bone damage postoperatively. And this last infectious study here was looking to assess therapeutic efficacy. Um, so this was a study testing a combination of a P53 agonist with a BCL2 inhibitor in a malaria model as a prophylaxis therapy. Now, I mentioned all of the things that you can use the IVIS to image, but one of the great things about IVIS that I showed you in that middle study on the previous slide is you can actually image multiple things at the same time. So this is a really nice example of that <clears throat> from the field where the authors actually imaged more than one type of luciferase within the same mouse. So this group was looking to monitor inflammation in a meningitis model. To monitor neuroinflammation and neuronal cell damage, they use this mouse model that's transgenic for GFP, or I'm sorry, GFAP luciferase, so glial fibrillary acidic protein luciferase, which is a really clean marker for neuronal damage. So when neuronal damage happens, you express luciferase in this mouse model. They injected a bacteria that expresses Lux luciferase, which is great because it encodes its own substrate. It doesn't require a luciferase substrate injection, so it's always on, but it is dimmer than typical luciferases. So the Lux luciferase and the GFAP luciferase are spectrally separated enough to use them in the same mouse model. So looking at this figure on the left, they gave the mice this meningitis infection, and they were able to monitor the infection with the bacterial Lux signal and the neuroinflammation with the Lux signal at the same time in the same mouse. They treated these mice at 17 hours, and you can see on the bottom half of this image 
that following treatment, the bacterial infection was able to be cleared. However, the neuronal damage remained. So this would indicate that yes, treating with traditional antibiotics is able to clear the bacterial infection, but you may have to consider how you're gonna treat the downstream pathogenesis from these type of infections. Also on the right here, I just wanna highlight that the IBIS does have multiple fields of view. So a lot of images, you're probably used to seeing whole mouse, but this is kind of nice at highlighting field of view A, where you can get much higher resolution images. And again, you can also remove organs and image them to confirm where your signal is coming from. Now, switching away from infectious disease and looking at a stem cell example, therapeutic effects of stem cells are often hampered by acute donor cell death as well as potentially migration away from the damaged areas. This is likely due to the fact that those injected cells don't have the physical cues for engraftment when you put them into the mice. So in this study, the authors aim to evaluate different biomatrices that would hopefully have the potential of providing a suitable scaffold for the stem cells to grab onto and enhance their survival. So they implanted all of these uh, stem cells within these different matri gel mixtures and monitored the stem cell survival and engraftment over time within these mice. Now, one of the really great features of the IVA spectrum that you guys have is that it is capable of this advanced feature called spectral unmixing. And I wanted to mention it in this presentation because this does give the, you the ability to use even more fluorescent reporters and to use different fluorescent reporters together. So what is spectral unmixing? Uh, kind of the easiest way to describe this is literally separating colors from each other. Um, if you're familiar with flow cytometry at all, spectral unmixing is kind of analogous to compensation. So there are two main reasons why users may want to use spectral unmixing. One, probably more popular than the other, and that would be to increase your signal to background ratio when you, high, you have high levels of tissue autofluorescence present. So looking at this example here, if you were looking at an image of the tissue autofluorescence in this mouse, it would be very hard to pick up this very tiny DHE signal here. So spectral and mixing can be used to remove mouse tissue autofluorescence and give you a clean fluorescent signal from your fluorescent reporter. You can also use it in a slightly more complex example, which would be to specifically separate co-localized probes if you're using multiple fluorescent reporters in the same mouse. So I wanted to show you one example of how this was done in the field back to an infectious disease model. This was showing concomitant imaging of two different bacterial populations. So the authors here orally administered this lactic acid bacteria expressing one of two different reporters. And then they imaged the mice and performed spectral and mixing. And if you look at the composite images over here on the right, you can see that they were able to spectrally separate these two different fluorescent reporters and actually look for differential co-localization or uh, differential localization uh, within the intestines of these mice. Okay, now for the second half of the talk, I wanted to focus on 3D imaging because this is a unique feature to the Spectrum CT system that you guys do have. <clears throat> and 3D is really going to give you a lot of improvements over 2D imaging. So true 3D can only be achieved via application of tomographic algorithms. And your Spectrum CT system is the only system capable of doing both bioluminescence and fluorescence tomography. A couple of the quick benefits of this here. You are able to provide more information on source location and source depth <clears throat> by looking at 3D imaging. You can also use 3D tomography to quantify your activity in terms of picomoles of fluorescent dye or actual numbers of cells. So in this example here, we're actually showing liver toxicity by a cell death marker being expressed in liver cells following administration of a liver damaging drug. So 3D is really more than just a pretty picture. Uh, 2D is uh, tried and true. We now have over 12, 14,000 applications that use 2D imaging. Um, and 3D imaging is, I think, underutilized. I think it can give you a lot more information from your studies and you have the cap capacity to do it, so why not? Um, just a couple of things here that 3D can do for you. It can improve your quantification. So 3D imaging will actually take into account how light sources scatter 
and are attenuated at depth within the mouse. So your quantification becomes much more accurate when you take that into account with 3D imaging. 3D imaging can also give you true co-localization. <clears throat> so if you make the assumption that two things are co-localized in 2D, it could be risky. The surface pattern of different sources in the mouse is often much larger than the source it actually represents. So it can be easy to falsely assume that two things are co-localized just based on a 2D image. Whereas in a 3D image, you can actually identify true co-localized proteins or cells, et cetera. So <clears throat> now that I've told you all about why you want 3D, I also just wanted to bring this slide in to show you that not only can you use 3D to give you your optical signal registration, but you guys do have the spectrum CT, so you can add in CT scans <clears throat> to your 3D optical signal. So shown here are some examples here, nanoparticle targeting to tumors and infection targeting fluorescently labeled antibiotic that is visualized with mouse CT imaging. <clears throat> and you can also bring in different CT contrast agents to give you more information about soft tissue details. So here we're actually looking at mouse vasculature in this left image here. So in short, you really get the full performance of optical imaging and CT in a single platform using the Spectrum CT. One other cool feature that I also think is underutilized is the automatic mouse atlas registration. So this is something that you can bring into your 3D images to give you a better understanding of the anatomical location of your signal outside of just the skeleton, for example, with the CT. So the software will actually register the skin <clears throat> of your mouse and reconstruct it with or without specific organs as you please. <clears throat> <clears throat> this will help you get more, <coughs> excuse me, facial information <clears throat> and context in your 3D optical images. <clears throat> so this is one example from the neuroscience field where they did bring in that mouse atlas and actually use that as their skeleton. This is an example using deep brain stimulation. So this is used to treat a lot of neurological conditions it's currently being tested for the intervention of, intervention of neuropsychiatric conditions. However, it's pretty poorly understood and it requires a lot more optimization to limit side effects. So <clears throat> these authors developed a microstimulator device that allowed them to actually simultaneously image live bioluminescence based on TLR2 activation when they stimulated the brain with these deep brain stimulators. And they showed that over time, they were able to show bilateral stimulation with these two dots here and unilateral stimulation only appearing with one dot. <clears throat> and they confirmed what previous studies had shown that they did have this secondary signal that is just constitutively expressed in all of these mice. Okay. And shifting gears to a different therapeutic area, now we're looking at extracellular vesicle targeting. So as I mentioned, with fluorescent reporters, you can label essentially anything, and that is the beauty of them. So here, <clears throat> the authors were IV injecting fluorescently labeled extracellular ves vesicles. Um, and they have a PBS control mouse on the right here for comparison's sake. <clears throat> and the fluorescent label that they used here is something called DIR. So as I mentioned at the beginning, redder is better. We always highly recommend choosing red shifted reporters and DIR is a near infrared reporter. It's a lipophilic fluorescent dye. And so it's really, really great for in vivo imaging. However, when using things like these, you have to consider that the dye itself does have a longer half-life than the extracellular vesicles. So at some point, if you're in, in vivo imaging for a long time, you may be imaging just the distribution of remaining dye as opposed to the actual extracellular vesicles. So something to consider when you're choosing fluorescent reporters, depending on what you're trying to monitor. And again, on the right side here, they did harvest specific organs and performed ex vivo IVIS imaging to confirm their organ specific extracellular vesicle localization. <coughs> and a, <clears throat> an oncology example that also uses nanoparticles. So I said that combining multiple imaging modalities can really give you more insight and help you evaluate targeted therapeutic efficacy while also monitoring disease regression during treatment. So here 
they actually used 3D IVIS imaging to assess the targeting specificity and accumulation of their fluorescently labeled <clears throat> biologic to their disease target. So this example is just showcasing co-localization of fluorescently labeled nanoparticles, which are shown here in pink, to tumor sites that are expressing luciferase, which are shown in blue as they pop up there. <clears throat> they overlaid this again with the micro CT skeleton to give them enhanced anatomical reference. <clears throat> I think this may be the last example here. This is a, just a really beautiful example of how 3D imaging can help you identify something that you may not have seen with just 2D imaging. So this group was looking at UTI infections. They inoculated an infection in the bladder and then they waited two weeks until it made its way up to the kidneys and the ureter. So they confirmed this location using 3D imaging that the infection had made it up to the kidneys and decided they were ready to start treating the mice. They treated those mice and then came back a week later and re-imaged. Their second image in 2D looked very similar to their pretreatment image. And if you were just looking in 2D, you may think, wow, this treatment didn't work. But they had a hunch that that was not what was happening. So they went ahead and performed 3D imaging again, this time adding in a second CT contrast agent, barium sulfate, so that they could better highlight the gut. And what had happened was that their treatment was treating the primary infection in the kidneys. <clears throat> you no longer see it in the kidneys here but the mice were actually re-ingesting tainted materials and generating a new infection in the gut. So again, great example as if you were only looking at 2D, you may have misjudged whether or not your treatment was working, but 3D was able to show that they were actually just generating a new infection. So 3D will really help you get that pinpoint localization of your source compared to 2D imaging. So in summary, 3D, can be used to help resolve disease foci. And you can also use this to identify the depth and location non-invasively of your sources. <clears throat> it can be helped, or sorry, it can be used to help highlight underlying disease mechanisms and molecular activity, and can be used to assess targeting specificity and accumulation of different particles <clears throat> within the different modalities. This is kind of an overview of all of the IVA systems that we have. You guys, again, have the Spectrum CT, which as you can see looking at the top here is capable of all of these, which is why I added this slide. So I know I talked a lot about 3D, but 2D imaging is still fantastic and can give you tons of information out of a single mouse, save you a lot of time and money compared to harvesting uh, organs at various time points throughout a study. You can just monitor that non-invasively. <clears throat> you can do this with bioluminescence and fluorescence. I also mentioned spectral unmixing, which is a great tool if you're using really any fluorescent reporter, but especially if you want to use multiple reporters in the same mouse. <clears throat> and 3D imaging is a great addition to any study, in my opinion. With that, I think there is a Q&A ongoing, so happy to answer any questions if you have any for me. Great. Thank you, Sarah, so much. Does anybody have any questions for Sarah or for Amy about animal imaging facility? Please um, <clears throat> raise your hand, put your question in the chat. Oh, here we go. Sarah Moore has a question. Please unmute yes. yourself. I am. Thank you. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, my experience has been with the 2D imaging and not since 2012 um, and about to plan some of some tumor targeting molecular imaging work um, with some proteins we've engineered. And I was wondering about the need for ex vivo uh, organ resection um, and if there's a sense that with the 3D optical you still need to plan in doing the ex vivo resection look at biodistribution? Are you able to do quantitation with the 3D where the ex vivo resection is no longer necessary? Yes, so with the 3D imaging, you can quantify each of those different organs individually. So that is entirely possible. We do see a lot of labs, even with 3D imaging, remove the organs because they're already doing downstream analysis for other things as well, like flow cytometry to look at specific cell populations, et cetera. Um, so it depends on what you look at. <laughs> Um, but I, I would say, to answer 
your question, you can still quantify in a 3D image organ specific localization. And just you to follow up there, fluorescence or fluorescence? Fluorescence would be like an Alexa Fluor 680 okay. in your IR dye. Yeah. Um, so follow up with that for the quantitation, it would be new learning for me for the methods of quantitation for 3D. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the, between you and Amy, what are the resources for learning the software and the quantitation um, in, a, in a newer system for me, for my lab? Uh, I don't know what Amy has for resources, but I am available at all times. I'm happy to set up a phone call to walk you through some of the software and help you figure that out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I am. Um, we tend to uh, help people get their images um, and start basic quantification. And then for any upper level, we tend to contact Perkin Elmer. Um, <laughs> and they have a fantastic <laughs> group of people who will help us walk through just about any kind of um, uh, research analysis. So they've been, they're fantastic support. So that's kind of that, but that's how the workflow goes. We can get you started and help you with your preliminary um, stuff and help you analyze preliminary your data. Prelimin uh, can I say that word today? Um, <laughs> we can help you <laughs> get started. Um, and then for any upper level stuff, we usually loop in Perkin Elmer because it tends to get much more specific at that point. So, yeah. Thank and you. Sarah, I'm, I'm also happy to help with experimental design. If you're looking to do something new that you, you have questions about, happy to go over your experimental design first. Um, especially when you're getting into things like quantification that does require an extra step of actually plating cells in a well plate and imaging that well plate and then applying that onto your 3D images. Um, so yeah, just a couple of extra things to consider for experimental design if you're looking to do that. I'll definitely reach out because that will be some new okay. steps. So thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Um, I, have a pic I have a question from Steve. How big of an animal can you image in the IBIS? Great question. Um, so very easily mice, rats, guinea pigs. I've seen small monkeys, small rhesus mon monkeys. Um, but yes, I would say that's probably about as big as you can get. <laughs> and it, the limiting factor isn't necessarily the imager, it's more the anesthesia. Yeah, for those larger animals, we don't have a manifold to keep them asleep. So that would be something that would require some finagling on your part if you're looking to do larger animals. Uh, it won't CT scan though the larger animals, just the imaging. Yeah, yeah, just the yeah optical signal. We've actually imaged plants. There you go. Oh, in the in their pot, <laughs> luminescent. So, mm -hmm. like I said, endless applications. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Does anybody else have any? Oh, here's another question. Dave has a question. Dave, can you unmute yourself? Hi, uh, this is Dave Follett. Uh, I actually run the 3D printing core facility uh, at UMass. So my question isn't necessarily about animals, but I know people use uh, CT scanning to evaluate, say, the quality of parts that they've made in terms of like voids generally uh, to see if there are spaces inside. Uh, I know for metals, you need very high power 3D or CT scanning. But with this instrument, could you look inside of polymer parts? Is that possible? Do you look inside of polymer parts? So the, Amy, do you know the answer to that? Well, yes, because we've played with it a little bit. So we have, Dave, we have CT scanned, 3D printed um, things before. Uh, but it does depend on the polymer. Does that okay. answer? Do you, have, do you know what determines which polymers are okay or less good? No, but we could set up um, a research project where we we would determine that. <laughs> okay, no, that works. <laughs> I don't know which polymers. I mean, just think, you know, density of bone versus density of soft tissue. I mean, we can, if it has similar density to bone, we can image it pretty well. Okay. Um, but metals um, refract the, the x-rays too easily, so. Right, right. Okay, Sarah Moore has another question. Go ahead, Sarah. Yes, thank you. Um, again, asking about this new capability to me <laughs> of the CD, of the CT um, piece. What are 
I'm guessing the scan time increases if you layer CT on top of optical imaging. Um, what are the drawbacks of using the CT feature when also doing the optical imaging? Or would the recommendation be we have the equipment, add the extra one or two minutes because we'll be able to do that, that mapping better with the, the CT as part of the image? So compared to the optical imaging, the CT is relatively quick. Um, if, if you don't need it, then you don't need to expose the mice. Uh, like if you're imaging, 3D imaging, twice or three times a week over a long course of study, eventually you probably wouldn't want to expose the mice to that much. <clears throat> but in general, compared to the optical scan time, depending on how bright your signal is, adding in the CT doesn't add that much time, if that answers your question. Yeah. Great. Um, Musa has a question. Oh, sorry. Let me add to that. You can also image for 2D. You can image five mice at a time, whereas when you're doing the 3D imaging, it's one, maybe two mice, is that right? Yeah. yeah, so one for fluorescence, two for bioluminescence. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're just doing 2D imaging, yeah, quick and quick and dirty, you can do five at a time. But with the 3D, it does require not only more computing power for the software to only be able to do one at a time, but the, uh, the way that the machine is set up, you can only scan a single mouse for fluorescence or two for bioluminescence in 3D. Okay. That's definitely a difference too. And it, yeah, it takes, it certainly takes longer. Thank you. But the CT itself doesn't add that much time. Great. Um, so the next question is from Musa. What is the benefits of this methodology in terms of spatial or temporal resolution when compared with CT or others? Yes. So in, in terms of this CT compared to others, Musa, or? I welcome you to unmute yourself, Musa, so you can speak. <laughs> or comparing CT to other modalities. I, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when you compare this methodology uh, with other optical imaging techniques, what is the benefits of like temporal uh, and spatial resolutions? I think I may understand your question. So with the spectrum CT, the addition of the CT to the optical signal is mostly used to add anatomical reference to your images. So I, I showed you there is that automatic mouse atlas registration that you can use, and that can be used in the absence of the CT. And it will still give you a good idea of where your signal is localized within the mouse, but adding the CT gives you true anatomical registration and that you know exactly where your skeleton is. And by adding in different contrast agents, like I showed you the kidney and the bladder model, <clears throat> you can really get true spatial resolution and more information about where your signal is located in vivo. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, great. Is there any other questions? Sarah, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> I'm gonna keep going while I have this great opportunity. Um, so a question about, you're talking about um, following tumor size, um, and I was wondering, that'd be like a response to therapy, for example, um, and I was wondering when you're thinking about that, is that major, mainly with bioluminescent tumors, or is the CT enabled a measurement that might be better than calipers? Um, we'd just love to hear a little bit more about that sense of looking at tumor size changes. Yep, so tumor size would be all based on your optical signal, so that would be either bioluminescence or fluorescence, depending on what your tumor is labeled with. Um, one thing to consider with regards to size measurements is that you can track tumor, I guess, growth and regression over time with the IVIS optical signal. But if you have, for example, a solid tumor that has a lot of immune infiltrate, it may be physically a larger tumor, but the source quantification that you're getting is only live tumor cells, not the full volume of that tumor, if that makes sense. So you, you will generally see the same trends over time with like a caliper measurement versus an IVIS measurement. Um, but depending on tumor type, that is something that can come into play. If you have a lot of other infiltrate in your tumor type, it may alter the volume a little bit. Thank you. Um, yeah. And just one more follow-up, just because I'm rusty on this one. No um, at the illumination compared to translumination, um, there yes. was a brief comparison about when you're choosing each one. Could you just go into a little more detail in thinking yeah, about sure. um, the advantages and disadvantages of those two illumination mm -hmm. methods? Yep, so epi-illumination is standard 2D fluorescence. 
So that will have exciting light coming from the top of the stage and then you'll collect admitted light back into the camera. What transillumination does is it actually reroutes the excitation light to come up underneath the stage. And the mouse sits on this new platform that has a bunch of little holes and a grid on it. And you can kind of navigate that light to excite within each of those two millimeter beams wherever on the mouse you want to image. So it gives you much deeper tissue penetration of the excitation light and you can get more better deeper tissue imaging with trans illumination than you can with just epi illumination. But if a tumor and on just, the surface, like a xenograft, epi might yeah, be. Yeah, 2D epi illumination, totally fine. Mm -hmm. Great, and I have a question from Neeraj. Can we image mice mammary glands at high resolution after injecting certain types of cells into the mammary gland and track them Spatial temporarily. Do we have to use luciferous tag cells for that? I'm sorry if I messed that up. <laughs> uh, sorry, let me just pop up the chat. So Thank you. Read as well. That's probably easier. <laughs> yeah, the um, question is about okay, mammary gotcha. glands and cells. Um, uh, yes, you can easily image the mammary glands. You would probably flop the mouse on its back. Could be so when you're imaging, you want to put the mouse in the orientation where your signal is in direct view of the camera if you can. Um, so that would be the first thing I would recommend. Uh, second thing, do you have to use luciferase tagged cells? So no, you can use a fluorescent reporter for this as well. Um, lu luciferase generally works really well if you have small cell populations because there's such little signal to background ratio. It makes your analysis faster and easier. You don't have to worry about mass tissue autofluorescence. Um, if you do decide to go with fluorescence, just again, redder is better. Make sure it's red shifted. You'll, you'll get tissue penetration to the mammary glands easily. Uh, Sarah, I have a question about luciferase. Um, you were mentioning a bunch of new luciferases that are becoming more and more common. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one being already completely active. Is that right? Lux? Yeah. So that's a bacterial lux luciferase. It's only in okay. bacteria. Okay. Um, and then for the um, luciferase, we have firefly and ranilla luciferase still. Yep. Um, is there more now that I'm uh, missing? Yeah, um, I, I believe it's Promega has something called nano luciferase, yeah. uh, very, very similar to ranilla luciferase with regards to having to IV inject in the flash kinetics. Um, mm -hmm. So there are a couple other ones out there that are slightly different, but um, not I would say if you're using looking to use two luciferases together, ranilla and firefly is the most common because of the substrate differentiation and the flash kinetics versus long kinetics for firefly. So um, they're all, they don't use the same substrate injection, right? You have to do right. yeah, uh, ranilla is cilantrozine. Yeah. Okay. And nano luke has its own substrate as well. I don't recall what it is off the top of my head. Right. Okay. But is that one IV? I think that is also IV. Okay. Yeah, I think it's similar to Renala. <clears throat> I think I've seen that one too, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we don't have any of those in-house. We I think we just have Renala and uh, Firefly. But. Uh, you also have a lot of, Perkin-Elmer also has a lot of other injectables for mm -hmm. um, uh, some other things like inflammation and are there some that are really popular? Uh, yeah, so we have, a very broad array of fluorescent proteins <clears throat> that you can either use to tag your own reagents or that are ready-made to detect certain things. Um, so I think one of the slides that I showed was actually the one that was looking at liver toxicity in 3D that was using a next in vivo. Um, so we induced liver inflammation and damage, then you can come in with a fluorescent reagent like an next in vivo, which uh, as the name might suggest, can uh, detect a next in expression, which is associated with apoptosis. So I would say an ex in vivo is probably a popular one to look at cell death. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we, we have a lot of others that are used in tumor models, um, depending on what you're looking to see. So if, if you have a specific application, then I can see if I can pick out some that might be worth your while, but they all have very specific indications. Um, as far as like a broadly applicable one, I'd probably say an ex in vivo or for like tumor models, hypoxysense is uh, one I've seen used to measure tumor specific hypoxia. What about arthritis? Um, I would have to look into specific arthritis. 
reagents that we have. So I think the, um, the take home message from that is people should contact you and give you their ideas and then you can sure. point them in the right direction. There's I just certainly too can. much, there's too much to review in a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah, there, there's a lot. I, I tried to fit little bits and pieces of all of those applications you listed in there, but yeah, and there I appreciate are that. You did endless possibilities. <clears throat> Lisa, were there any more questions? Nope, that's it. So if great. that's it, I'll close out the seminar. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank yeah, you, Lisa. And, and all Andrew. my contact info is saved in there. Feel free to reach out with any more questions. Great. So thank you all for attending today's seminar and a big thank you to Amy and Sarah. Throughout the series, we'll be featuring individual core facilities and relevant technologies. Our next seminar is scheduled for Tuesday, October 6th, in which we'll be hearing from Steve Isles about the state-of-the-art instrumentation for characterizing elements and compounds found in the mass spectrometry facility. So save the date and we hope to see you there. Goodbye everyone, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day.